Good evening and thank you for being here and to the ones who aren't here yet, um, once you pay the fine, you'll be allowed in. Uh, my name is Bill Connell. I am the storyteller in residence currently for Cape Breton Regional Library. I'm the third in a string of bearded, gray-haired, grubby old men who, who have been uh, offered the title. And I'm quite happy to be here. We had our last live presentation in February and then um, the Trump disease hit us and uh, we went kind of sideways. So we're now doing our second uh, live session. The first one was a month ago at the new moon and the other previous incumbents in the storyteller uh, position joined me, Ken Chisholm and uh, Renal Labelle. So here we are tonight and we have some guests with us uh, too. Meryl McGinnis is a, a, a friend and a neighbor and he was the first person up my driveway when we moved here, which is a story I may tell later. <laughs> He's a fourth generation lobsterman, a fire chief and what else? Counselor for 12 years, you say, just coming to the end of your term. And his daughter now has his fishing license and she's the fifth generation and her daughter goes out as well. So there'd be six generations of McGinnises on the water and uh, out of Little River. And our other guest is Nancy Smith. And Nancy is also a former fire chief of the North Shore and District Volunteer Fire Department. She was the first uh, female chief in Cape Breton and probably in Nova Scotia. Is that right, Nancy? Uh, it's, uh, there was another one very close, so I'm not, one of us was the first. I was the first one on North Shore, anyway. <laughs> okay, well, you're our guest tonight, so you can be the first in Nova Scotia if you want. Yeah, okay, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And we don't really have an agenda, we're just going to try and make this as close to a kitchen table as we can and uh, pass stories around and see where we end up. I did one of these with uh, Hector McNeil at Louisburg at the fortress uh, at the playhouse there. And he said after, you know, Bill, I came with a dozen stories and I only told two of them. Uh, you'd say something about a horse and I'd remember a story about a horse and follow that one down. So we had a good time with that. Would you like to start, Mr. McGinnis? I have you on my screen. What have you got to say to us? Okay. Yeah, sure. Well, I, the, the first uh, story that came to my mind actually uh, happened about four or five hundred feet uh, from where we're where I'm sitting tonight and <laughs> where we live right now, at the home of a gentleman called Kenneth McGinnis. And Kenneth McGinnis was a good friend of a highly regarded doctor in Victoria County by the name of uh, C. L. McMillan. He, uh, he had a sort of a stand-in agreement with, with Kenneth McGinnis that any time uh, he was overtired and not able to get back to Black, he had a bed welcome for him at any time that he was, that he was available 24-7. So anyway, it just to sort of, I guess the, the gist of the story is how, how things have changed, uh, basically from there's a bridge to the bottom of Smokies, what's consider, considered the North Shore. And uh, there were uh, three ladies expecting babies on the same night, on the 22nd of March in 1935. And uh, one of the ladies was in Britain Cove, which was sort of the nucleus of Kenneth's, Kenneth's uh, dwelling. <laughs> and uh, Dr. McMillan, uh, he, he uh, delivered a baby in French River, which is Annie McGinnis, who was still living, Charles McGinnis's sister. And another one was at Barraswa, and to, to uh, Annabelle Smith, who was Evelyn Smith, who was passed on. And the last child to be born was uh, Early Genghis McCaskill, who was born in Rare Little River. And they he had like five siblings prior. So, 
or his, his mother did. And anyway, in the morning, just after daylight, Dr. McMillan came and knocked on the door of, of Kenneth and he said, well, I, he said, I had a, an awful night. He said, I'm wondering if I'm going to take you up on that, on that bed if it's still available. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And Kenneth, of course, was curious, wondering, well, what's the news? Well, he said, I just delivered three babies. I, and I just came from Rachel McCaskill's. So the first salute out of Kenneth was, oh my God, the poor woman. Because he figured out she had, she had the three of them. <laughs> With her having three children, she thought, she thought now she had she had some not, not eight or nine children, right? But that's how small our world was in them days. Like the three of them were born on the North Shore, but but Kenneth thought that the three of them came in the one at the one household because they didn't know that there was a child being expected in the French River, and they were worlds away at that time. But that's how things have changed uh, in, in eighty-five years. So that's. Uh, that's my first story. So I am always amazed whenever you tell a story, Merrill, that you know um, not only the story, but the dates and the time and who was there and probably what they were wearing at the same time. You have a I don't, I don't, marvelous I don't memory remember for detail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nancy said she's only got one story. I, I don't yeah. know if uh, we should call on her now or not. It, yeah, it's going to run I, for 45 I, yeah. minutes, right? Yeah. But I will tell this one story. I, there may be another one to come up, but this is the one that I like. It's about Danny McDonald, who lived at Red Cove. Um, so a bit of background. This is back in the 40s. And back then, um, to get your driver's license, all you had to do, just like uh, sports fishing now, just go buy your license and no, no road tests or written tests or anything. So then most of the people had horse and wagon or sleigh and the horse and the driver became, they could communicate with each other. So say if a, a guy wanted his horse to, um, to move or go faster, he just flicked the reins and go giddy up. And then to, to, to make him stop, he would pull on the reins and say, ho, oh. so anyway, that's the background. So my mother-in-law, Evelyn, was an excellent driver. And there weren't very many vehicles uh, on the shore at the time, but her father had a truck and she used to drive it around the farm and she became, well, she, I think it was in her anyway to be a good driver. And she taught quite a few people how to drive, including her husband. And after they were married, they moved uh, next door to Danny. And so Danny decided that he thought that he'd like to have a truck and he'd drive. And Danny lived up on a hill. So he asked Evelyn if she'd mind teaching him how to drive. And Evelyn said, sure. So they spent evenings driving around the field and he was getting along quite good. And then Evelyn thought, well, maybe he's, he's good to hit the road. And there was, wasn't much traffic back then, so you could take your chances. So, and as I said, he lived up on a hill. So down the driveway, they start going. And as they're going down the driveway, the truck is picking up more speed and going faster and faster. And Evelyn's getting a bit uh, nervous. So she said, Danny, Danny, slow down. And, and then Danny start realizing, yeah, it's going too fast. So he had his hands on the wheel, a debt grip on the wheel. And she said, the brakes, Danny, the brakes, Danny. And he's starting to holler, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and finally, Evelyn had to jump over and slam the brakes on herself. But they, didn't get, they get to the road and some miracle, they got out on the highway. But they, it was a little while before Danny ventured back out on the highway again. But he did learn to drive and he did get his license. So that's my story. <laughs> Good one, dear. <laughs> I have a, a short one that's this I got from your neighbor up there, Alan McGinnis. Um, X migration has always been a problem here, and, and young people would leave the North Shore in Cape Breton and go to work, you know, in Halifax or in Ontario, and many that went to the New England states, what they call the Boston states uh, here. And there was young, one young fellow that left, and uh, he was gone 
25 years or so when he came back for a visit, went out on the boat with his two uncles and he was full of himself. Oh, he did so well. He had a big house and lovely children and his children were in a wonderful school and everything was so much better in Boston than it was in the backwoods of Cape Breton. And the uncles were getting a little bit weary of this. And one of them says to him, now, Roddy, when you were here, you, you had a, the Gaelic. You spoke the Gaelic pretty well. He said, do you still have the Gaelic? He said, no, no. He said, there's, there's no need for it where I am. He said, but uh, I can understand it, okay, but I can't speak it. Ha, huh, says the uncle. I have a dog that can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. The, this story and and many many others that I tell, we had a project here, the North Shore Gaelic Heritage Society, about ten years ago. Uh, had a project for the summer. We we went out and interviewed. Uh, we did sixty-two hours of interviews and videotaped them all. And so I've been combing through them looking for information. And that's where that came from. Yeah, I had one about a, a fellow who lived at Breck Cove. And uh, he was quite the character, uh, very colorful. He was, he's known uh, province wide anyway, everybody seems to know him, but it was Party House Central at his place. And um, one day a minister decided to go visit him. And it was after a big bash that was there, there was bottles all over the place and the place didn't look all that good. So the minister said to him, Joe, how would you like it now if I got up in church Sunday and told everybody about what the look of this place is with all the bottles and everything? And Joe right away without that and I said, oh no, you better not do that. The minister got very confident. He thought, ah, oh, I think I'm getting to him. And he said, now, Joe, why would I do not want me to do that? Because next weekend, everybody will be here. <laughs> <laughs> not now, thanks. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'll have a, I have another little one, a travel related. Here about. Uh, so, okay. Do you want to Certainly, do yes. Well. It was around when they were doing the uh, Cabot Trail around Tarbot. It's only three, three or four years ago, maybe a little more. And uh, I happened to be up at uh, Tim Hortons one day, and Sandy McRae and his daughter sat alongside me, and we got talking and talked about how nice the David job was going along in uh, in uh, Tarbot. And, oh yeah, that was great. And and he said, "Well, he said." Oh, when they put that when the traffic signals are up, we, we, we think we're in an awful inconvenience having to wait for two, two or three minutes. And uh, anyway, uh, he, t he, he relayed a story to me about his mother was, well, born in, in Reco and she married. Uh, Sandy's father li lived in the, on the Meadow Road, and they wanted she wanted to go to Reco to uh, to visit her parents. So Sandy was delegated. He was like twelve or thirteen years old at the time. He was to drive the sleigh, and uh, he said that early, long before daylight, his father got up and kindled the fire and put the fire on and got things warmed up and put a couple of bricks in the oven and went out and watered the horse and harnessed him up and got the sleigh all ready and. His mother got up and made breakfast, and after daylight, off they went, headed for Reco. But to sit in on the bricks for this, the only warmth they had. This was a cold day in February. So they stopped at a place called Colin Smith's, which is in Indian Brook, near, near where the fire hall is. That was sort of their halfway point. They stopped there for a break. They got there around noon and, and uh, wanted to water the horse and have a little cup of tea before they headed on to Reco. So finally, about dark, they landed Reco, and that was that was the day trip. And what he was getting at, he said, now 
when we're driving in our vehicles and the stop sign comes up in front of us, we think the world is going to win because you have to wait there for four or five minutes to, to, to uh, help the construction site. So he said, what a difference in our, in his lifetime. You just imagine what a difference it made, what he experienced in, in uh, you know, a 70 year period, close to that. But he was just, uh, that was just the way things were when he was a kid. You, you took a day to get to Rectal, as opposed to, you can do it now in 25 minutes. And it certainly brought uh, things into perspective for me that day. Yeah. Well, in our lifetime too, Meryl, when before Kelly's Mountain to go to Sydney was a, yes. yeah. a, day, a day trip. You couldn't mm -hmm. run to Sydney a couple or two or three times in the run of the day. Yeah. You had to go across two fairs. Two fairs. Yeah. 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 And yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah what a difference. There is. Meryl, you mentioned Indian Brook, and that brought something to mind for me of Catherine Smith that lived there. And uh, it's, uh, you know, if you live in the city, your mail comes to your, to your door or to your mailbox. And if you're in town, you probably get a mailbox at the post office. Out here, they bring it right to the foot of the lane, which is quite convenient a lot of the time. Except that sometimes in Cape Breton in the winter, it snows a bit. Quite a bit, you might say. And they, they clear the snow, of course, with snow plows. And the drivers are really careful, but once in a while, they, they nip a mailbox, you know. And there was a storm, and the driver came by with his plow, and he hit Catherine's mailbox and knocked it off. And she said, well, that's, that's the price of living here. And she put the mailbox back up, and that's all there was to it. And about 10 days later, there was another storm. And didn't he come and hit the mailbox again and knock it off? Well wasn't quite so placid that time. So she was in Bedeck in the post office. She saw him and said, Roddy, I want to talk to you. He said, I just let you know that I put my mailbox up closer to the house. Oh, why is that, Catherine? Well, so the next time you come to knock it over, at least the driveway will be clear. <laughs> yeah. I, I can relate to that, Bill. Uh, when the um, community boxes just started here, um, one winter, it was a brand new mailbox, the snowplow knocked it off, and it was a winter that we had a lot of snow, and I was like shoveling and throwing it up over my head, which is not fur, but <laughs> <laughs> when you're shoveling snow. Anyway, had to, had to keep the mailbox clean, got the mailbox back up, and next week, another storm, snowplow came, knocked it off. And right behind the snowplow was a big truck, and it ran over the mailbox. I said, that's it. So I call the post office. I want one of those <laughs> community boxes. I've had it with, <laughs> yeah, that's a pr it's a price you pay. But back in Catherine's time, there was no community uh, mailboxes. No, sure, yeah. Yeah. I guess it's a, it's a custom in some places in Ontario that, that kids drive around at night with a baseball bat and knock the mailboxes over, you know, and I, I know two people that solved that. One of them was uh, a lady who won the Leacock medal in earlier than I did anyway, and she, she put a slide on mailbox. She'd go down in the morning, put it on the post, pick up her mail and take the box with her. And the other one I saw on, on Facebook yesterday was a guy who filled his mailbox with concrete. Uh, said, Wait till he hit that with the bat. Yeah. If there's anyone there who would like to tell a story, just if you'd send a, a chat message to Tara, we'll put you in the line up here. Nancy's only had one story, but we haven't stopped her yet. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> It's, it's been oh, great. don't be sorry at yeah. all. That's what we're here for, dear. I should say, too, so the, if, if you're trying to find where the chat is for you, on the bottom of your screen, you should see a little menu bar. Am I right about that? If you, if you scroll right over the bottom, online. do you see a chat bubble? You might have to click on it to open it up. And then if it's, when it's open, you'll see there's a little way that you can write a message. And uh, if you have a story to share, just let us know and I can unmute you and, and take your video off. 
Well, they're coming on. I, I have another one that I could share with you. It's about a, a home not far from us. A lot of people in the community know where Bill and Fenella lived. It's uh, formerly called the Banana Farm. Hmm. And that house originally, it's, it's up by the Cabot Trail right now, close to the Cabot Trail, but it was built down, oh, about 800 feet from where it's located today. And my father often told this story. He was a, he was a great friend of the man who, who built that home. His name was Janalek Madsen. And it was actually the first job that my father ever worked at was with Janalek. He thought the world of him. This happened about close to 80 years ago, I guess. The cabot trailer came through and Janalek wanted to move the home. And he got a bunch of men gathered in the community. <clears throat> and uh, they started, it took them three days to move the house. And it's a two-story home. If you, some of you know the, the size of the place, it's a big house. No machinery. There was none, none available at the time, in this part of the world anyway. And they would put a capsule that, that, that put a, this, uh, a set in the, in, the, in the ground and they'd use a pole with a rope around it to, and walk around with, with the pole sort of winching it. And as the house has been moved, Janalik's wife uh, kept the stove on, made meals for all the men for the three days, for uh, tea in the morning and lunch, lunch at lunchtime, and tea in the afternoon, fed them all to keep them going. And also in the in the in the house was the was the pendulum clock. And if the, if the pendulum hit the side, it would stop the clock immediately. So after three days of, of moving this home, they put it where it's sitting today, and the clock was still running. Three days later, there's a, and and today in today's world, there'd be four engineers have to come to see if it could be done. Number one, and there'd be about eighteen pieces of machinery, and and they'd probably wreck the house before they got it there. <laughs> but how resourceful they, they were to uh, be able to do that. And just, that was just game second nature to them, you know, just everybody chipped in and not, not a penny paid to anybody. It was all just goodwill, of course. But that's how, uh, how able they were. Yeah. That uh, puts me in mind of um, when uh, the fire hall started, the Part of the fire hall at the um, Indian Brook School. So in 1963, yeah. the consolidated school was opened and the uh, five one room schools closed and the uh, Indian Brook became a fire hall. So after they got the building, um, they acquired a truck, and, but the truck wouldn't fit in the building. So, as Merrill said, no engineers. They took a power saw, cut the floor out, put gravel in there, and drove the truck in. No engineers, no permits. It was done. <laughs> yeah. That's the way it was. That's the way it, that's true, that still should be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Merrill, when they moved that house, that would have been with log rollers and, and horses, I guess. Would no, no, no horses. No, no, no. They did it with a, with a, you know what a capsum capsum is? It's it's a you, you you sort of land faster. You you put a, a, ca a structure in the in the ground, dig it, dig a hole, and, and sort of make a winch on it. And you, you tie a rope. That there's ropes. There's there's skids underneath the house, and then they had logs to, as rollers, and they pull pull the house on the logs along the ground. And then after they get it up to the capstan, they'd have to move the capstan ahead another 50 feet. And it took them a three day period to get it up there, to get it moved. But a, a, another story that comes to mind, but again, how resourceful they were. This happened in the home that I grew up in. It was, it was owned by a, an Urquhart gentleman. Uh, they see there was no, there was really no income for people back 70, 80 years ago, uh, when they started lobster fishing, it was mostly to do with the company store concept. You, they got three cents a pound for the lobster. And most of the lobster were just 
used as a, 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 an account. Like if they got if they got flour or the luxuries of life, they would just put that towards the bill. And I'd never see any cash. So the only way that to generate income was by uh, tra- trapping, fur trapping. And they used to go in teams. It was always two men left. They'd go, walk, leave, leave at daylight, and walk to dark, out along the, that have a certain pattern, going along rivers and have snares and traps and so on. And, and these two people that went, was one of them would be Brian McDonald's father, his name was Tommy, Tommy Peggy, we knew him as. And the other gentleman was Sandy Urquhart, and he lived also in Britain Cove. So they were a team, and they, they left in the morning and uh, got out to their designated spot and checked their snares all along the, the river and so on. And they had a, they had a shelter, they had, a, they, they had the shelter built in the fall so that no where it was at, and they had a shelter for the night. And, and they used to take supplies with them for breakfast. Anyway, they were making kindling, and Sandy Urquhart slipped, and the hatchet went in his groin. So there they were, he was sort of in a pickle, it had embedded right in his groin, and they got it out, and it was getting near dark, and uh, they had porridge, that oatmeal taken out to make porridge for the morning, and they took the, took the oatmeal, stuffed the wound with the oatmeal, and Tommy McDonald headed in for the, into Britain Cove. Got to the house where my sister and her husband are living right now. And of course, no telephones, no radios, but there is today. Got them people out of bed. Said, look, I have well, my buddies out in the woods. Hopefully not bled to death, but he's out there and he, we have to go and get him out of there. So they, the people in that house, because Tommy was tired at this point, he had a sort of a break. And they went and they gathered up four men in the community and mustered up enough to get the snowshoes off they went to pick up this Sandy Urquhart and when he got there luckily he was still well, didn't, hadn't bled to death because the porridge had chilled and the blood had, had stopped and uh, so they went to the woods and got poles and put them, made a stretcher and pulled them in with the snowshoes so they, 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 they could, he couldn't walk and he had a, he had a length the rest of his life after that. It it it, it, it cut a tendon in his uh, in his uh, groin, and it, it made me come to think of it. Somebody told me just the other day that now these uh, I was relaying a story about here in a, a news interview where some airplane landing in California saw a gentleman up in the air with a jet pack on his back at an airport, and now apparently there are there are First responders units, you're going to have to get one of these, Nancy. <laughs> the first responders now that are that can put a jet pack on their back and be out in a site five miles in the woods, like in three minutes, as opposed to two hours walking. But that's what the people had to do with what they had back 80 years ago, and they just did it. That's that was if not the man would have would have uh, died out there. But it was amazing what they what what they could do with what they had. But that was a big part of the livelihood on the North Shore for a lot of years. That's the only income they would see from year to year because otherwise they'd have no gener they'd no generate no money from they just generated food for themselves and with hay and feed the animals and to have beef and pork and so on. But the only income they would get is from, from the uh, from the fur business. And yeah. no fear of liabilities in those days, like we are now. We're no, no, true enough, yeah. Yeah, they, yeah. things had to be done and they did it, and there was not that fear there that hangs over us today. Yeah. Very resourceful. When the position of storyteller in residence came up, it was 2011, and I was I applied for it uh, after some merging from some friends, and... In, and I didn't get it because in my audition I told a trapping story about uh, Neil Roddy McDonald and Angie Tom 
And in the story that I told, um, they, they ended up, two trappers ended up killing a bobcat. And I guess that was a little too much for the, for the committee. But when I applied this time, I told a story about four men drowning and that was okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least the bobcat had some value, but sailors come and go. Eh? This is what I heard from, from uh, Angus McLeod, and he's, he tells me it's a true story. I've changed the names, of course, so I, I don't want my house to catch fire sometime. But these two guys, Robbie and, uh, and uh, Kenny, met in grade one in about 1969. I think they were both in detention at the time, and, and they've been friends ever since, and they were friends through their teen years and, uh, and eventually became drinking buddies, and they're still doing that. So every once in a while they get together and they have what they call a couple of beers, right? Which means probably between five and eight each. And they were over at Kenny's one afternoon and a butterfly came wandering by. And Robbie said, you know, Kenny, those things come from caterpillars. Go on. Yeah, it's true. They do. When they get mature, they spin a, a web around themselves like, uh, like a sleeping bag. It's called a cocoon. And they're in there for a while, and when they hatch out, they hatch as butterflies. Go on. Yes, and I'm telling you, you can prove it. You get one, put it in a jar, and just keep an eye on it. Well, Kenny thought this was a pretty good idea, so we got a jar from the kitchen and uh, put a handful of grass on the bottom of it. Didn't take him long to find a caterpillar. Put a lid on it and punched some holes in the top, and, and he set it under the porch step so it wouldn't get cooked in the, in the summer sun. And he just checked it every few days. And uh, a few days later, about 10 days maybe, they, they were doing the same thing again. Robbie was back over and Kenny went in the house to get some more beer. Rob ducked down, grabbed the jar from under the step, took the lid off, threw the caterpillar away, and then he fashioned a fake um, uh, cocoon from materials he had at hand, put the grass over it, put it back under the step, didn't say a word. About three or four days later, the phone rang, and it's Kenny. Hey, guess what, Rob? He's doing what you said that with that sleeping bag thing. Yeah, the uh, the cocoon. Yeah, what, yeah. What do I do now? Said, oh, just keep an eye on it. He'll come out as a butterfly. Well, how long does that take? Oh, I don't know, two or three weeks. You just check it out. So Kenny checked the jar every day for nineteen days. And on the 20th day, he was taken out from under the step and he just banged it gently against the step by accident and shifted the grass a little bit. And he held it up and he said, huh, that doesn't look right. And he took the lid off and brushed the glass out of the grass out of the way. And then he took the jar and he heaved it with all his might over the hedge and before it splashed into the pond, he was on the phone and talking to his friend saying, you dirty, rotten, low down, sneaking, and Robbie's laughing as well. Kenny, he says, you found the cheesy, did you? And they didn't talk for nearly two months. <laughs> that happened out the meadow, so you can probably guess who that was. <laughs> uh, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Remember, Meryl, um, when the fire was at Rat Cove the, um, in 68? And, 68, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was had come over the mountain and they were evacuating homes. And I, I'm not going to mention her name. There's an old lady. She lived alone. And when the men came to the door to evacuate her uh, house, they explained to her that that have to take all the furniture out or whatever she wanted to take out to save and that that loaded the load in the truck and she said oh just put it in the shed behind the house it'll be fine she <laughs> poor soul. she didn't think <laughs> she, she didn't realize that the, what was happening and she thought taken out of the house was okay put it in the shed was fine too it, yeah poor soul. but can i tell us those was stuff and other what that was that you and Alistair? That's and Alistair Alistair. And Alistair, Alistair, yeah. And yeah. Uh, is, is that we what went happened back? Off? We left. We, oh, absolutely, yeah. And we dropped her off. We took her up to Murdoch's store. Yeah. 
and we went back to try and see if we could get some of the yeah. furniture and the house was gone and i don't need it was in a 10 like a 10 minute yeah. cycle yeah and the house went that quick mm. that yeah. quick yeah. yeah yeah she didn't she didn't understand the oh, whole no. yeah i interrupted you you're going to tell another story oh, in your i will after i have another one but <laughs> after i will anybody oh. anybody in our chat room going to tell a story there's no, sorry, there, there, there's no comments in the chat room, so I don't see anyone. It makes me a little nervous that maybe um, they can't see the chat room or, or access it. So maybe someone just wants to fire me a message just to make sure it's up and working. Because um, I don't see any, no comments there. Oh, wait, no, yeah, so someone just says it's working. So they just don't have any stories. You've got them all mesmerized. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're spellbound. So, so um, here we go. And the stories are great. So you're getting lots of comments now. So no one's ready to share yet, but they're very happy to hear you guys. Good, dear, good. I, I mentioned when I was talking to you before we started here, well, when we had a rehearsal last week, that uh, that I might drop a name on the table and see what happened, and that would be Murdoch the Chief, Murdoch McCaskill. There was a group of, of people here called the North Shore Gaelic Singers, and I think the first, there was a trophy offered, I think the first time was in 1937, and there were five groups of Gaelic singers that competed for it, and the North Shore Gaelic Singers won. And they won every year, I think, until until they stopped doing it in the in the 1950s. But Murdoch, I, I never met him, of course. He he, he was apparently a small man, but uh, kind of like a, a a Boston bulldog. He didn't know he was small. And would that be accurate? You both knew him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good, sing, good singer too, <laughs> and a good singer too. Yeah, singer. they were actually they they went. Uh, all over Cape Breton, of course, to uh, to milling frolics, and they were they went to Expo '86 in Vancouver, and they were at the Smithsonian in Boston, and I don't know where all else. But anyway, Murdoch was a bachelor, and he lived just uh, just below where the Clucking Hen is now. And uh, one he had uh, nephews and nieces that lived right across the road. They were also McCaskills. Ken McCaskill, and did he have two sisters? Yes. Anyway, and one of these things they used to do, Ken said, for fun was they'd like to chase the sheep. And he said, we'd chase them all over until they got so tired, they were exhausted, and they'd just fall over and go to sleep. And Murdoch was always after them to stop chasing the dang sheep, you know. And, and Murdoch had a reputation for being really good with threats. Um, George Doffney told him, he, he threatened him and his brother. He said, you stop that or I'll hang you up on the back of the barn door. So pretty good threats anyway. One day, uh, Murdoch went up to Rec Cove to the store there and he was in visiting somebody and another friend came along he hadn't seen in a while. He said, Murdoch, well, why don't you come up to the house? We'll give you supper and you can get a ride back with the mail truck. So um, he did that. He went to the house and they were catching up on the news and the woman said, now, Murdoch, those, uh, those kids of Merdinas, they must be getting pretty big now, are they? Murdoch says they're as big as they're going to get if they don't quit chasing the dang sheep. <laughs> there was, uh, I was just thinking, I don't know if some, many of you are aware of Tom Wilson, who's the retired recreation director for municipality. He's, he's mm -hmm. doing a lot of walking. And his goal this year is to walk 2,020 2, kilometers for this year, which is quite a feat. And he's, if you, he's on the beach, but every time you go to the fair, you see him. And I was thinking Peggy Nicholson's grandfather, Peggy found records of her grandfather that used to be a lighthouse keeper. And there was, it was before the ferry service started because was, there was a, a peninsula going up there on the, on the beach. So there had to be a lighthouse there, and it was, there was a lantern that was in it. 
There was no automation. There was no power up there. So this Peggy's grandfather had to walk up there every evening to put the lantern on and walk back and then go back in the water to put it out because they had to, they couldn't, they had to spare the fuel. They wouldn't let it run for the day. So he had to go up in the morning and put the light out and walk back home again. And I was thinking that is, that is be 10 kilometers a day. So he walked 3,650 kilometers a year. And he kept a log. He had to keep a log for the government to, to verify that he uh, had done the job. And he probably got $10 a month to do it if he got that much. Just imagine it. So you imagine walking up that on that beach some days in February with a, not an ounce of shelter on it. it. Must have been just dreadful. But he, he did it. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing what they had to do. Going back to the North Shore Gaelic Singers, uh, in the 60s, I can't remember what year, but uh, the Queen Mother came to Sydney and Mary Burke, her lady from English, was, um, her responsibility was to um, get entertainment for the Queen, for the Queen Mother and the North Shore Gaelic Singers was one of the groups. So she went to see uh, Malcolm Angus McLeod, one of the Gaelic singers, and asked if they would perform before the Queen Mother at the Banchell in Sydney. Oh, absolutely. Yes, certainly will. And what date is that? And she said, it's on a Sunday. And he said, no, we can't. They didn't make any difference who it was. They were not singing on Sunday. Yes. Oh, for so it was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they used, they used to claim to take the rooster out of the hen house on the weekends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> well, yeah. There was, uh, related to that, there was a, where, what we call Maggie's, where my sister and her husband owned, we call, I always called it Maggie's. But there was, during the days of the, uh, Oxford Paper Company. There was people from all over the island working there, especially from Northern Cape Breton. One day, a guy, a gentleman from Cape North, walked all the way from uh, from Cape North, and he reached to French River to that house, just at dark, and went in and asked if he could have a bed, because he had to be to work for Monday morning. And uh, sure, they give him a, give him a feed and get, put him put him to bed and the whole nine yards. They breakfast and he was thanking them and he had no money to pay them, of course. And uh, he went to put the back pack on his pack on his back. And where are you going with that? Well, he said, I'm, I'm going to work. I have to be to work in the morning, Monday morning. No, you can leave here, but you're not leaving that on your back. That's disrespectful to the Sabbath and. You're, you could pick it here, pick it up on your way back. That's what he had to do. He left it there, for, left it there for till he came back up to, yeah. from working. Yeah, he wouldn't wouldn't let him on the road. Mm. These are pretty strict. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what they had to do. <clears throat> so the the trick for their Merrill was a uh, pack. When you talked about a pack, they made me think of the. The stories about the Lebanese traveler that used to come up on the shore before there were any roads and certainly no stores. Yeah. There was a fellow from Sydney and he used to load his pack with all sorts of stuff. Not, you know, not bolts of cloth, but bits of cloth and uh, needles and threads and pots and pans and stuff. And he'd make the rounds of the, of the North Shore. And he thought one time that he might have a bit of a retail advantage if he could speak to the people on the shore in their own language, which of course was Gaelic. And he didn't have any Gaelic. He had, he had decent English and Lebanese, of course, but we went to a friend of his and said, can you, can you teach me how to say in Gaelic, it's a lovely day, I have nice things for sale. And the guy said, yeah, yeah, I can do that. He said, here's, here's what you say. And I, and Nona, I can see Nona Mc on here and she's gonna start giggling right away because she knows the Gaelic. He said, here's what you say. Um, Hadovrikis Foskulcha. Try that, he says. Hadovrikis Foskulcha. Yeah, he did that a few times. And, and the other part of it is, uh, the Han the Krokakamak. 
of the Han the Krakika Mac. And so he practiced and he got, got feeling pretty good about it, practiced with a smile, says, and the Vrikis Fosculture, I guess how the Han the Krakika Mac, and when he was comfortable. So he went out with his pack the next round, and the first house he stopped at, there was an old lady on her hands and knees scrubbing the porch with a with a brush and a pail of soapy water. And he went to the bottom of the step and said, Ah, Hadovrikers Fosculture. I guess how the hand the crocodile mac, and she looked at him and glared, and picked up the brush and reefed it at him and caught him on the side of the face, because what he'd been taught to say was not, "It's a lovely day. I have nice things for sale." He said, "Your pants are open and your arse is hanging out." <laughs> We haven't had any, any Gaelic storytellers on this uh, on this show yet, but we may soon. I hope that would be that would be very good. Ah, and that's even quite a long time there. Yes. Okay. I have one more. I'm not mentioning any names with this. <laughs> with this one, I'm not mentioning any names. Okay. Okay. So anyway, there was this older lady. Uh, she she drove a car, and um, one day she got in a bit of a fender bender. So uh, between the police and the insurance company, they, they determined, well, the police determined it was, she was at fault, but that she should take a road test again, uh, a written road test, a written test and a driving test. So she went in and she took the, the first the vision test and her eyes were pretty good. And then it was the signs and she got eight out of 20, correct? And Stamina was a bit miffed at this. And, and he said to her, my dear woman, you don't know your signs. You've only know eight of them. And she said, well, I only travel, there's certain routes I go on and the other signs aren't on those routes. So why do I have to know them? So that's, <laughs> shook his head and he said well <clears throat> he said go out and stand by your car and we'll go do the road test now i'll be out I, we'll go do the driving test i'll be out in a few minutes so she went out and she had the keys in her hand she's standing by the car and um as he's walking towards her she hands over the keys to him and says here you can drive <laughs> <laughs> she was going to make sure that she passed that one <laughs> Yeah. Back to the to the um, North Shore Gaelic singers, his short little thing. They went to the Norfolk uh, uh, Music Festival in the States too. And uh, Buffy St. Marie, I think we all know who she was, is, um, was performing there too. There was, there was a, quite a few um, well-known uh, artists there. Uh, and Buffy St. Marie was one of them. And Malcolm Angus's wife, Annie Mae, it didn't matter who, if it was the queen or who it was, everybody was the same to her. And th they, she was in the next room to Buffy St. Marie and to Annie Mae, it could have been anybody. Buffy St. Marie said, oh, what a lovely lady. And <laughs> that was it. No, she was no, no making big, uh, uh, to do over her or not she although she did appreciate her but that's the way they were yeah yeah i believe that was the year that bob dylan was at that festival Could and be. if i'm not mistaken he borrowed a cigarette from one of the north shore gaelic singers Could have. Yeah. yeah i have someone who has a little story oh good and i see who it is good so it's, it's nona uh huh. Um, at Nona's house, anyway. So Nona, I'm gonna unmute you and take your put your video on, um, and then you'll be able to talk more freely. So just give us one second here. Hi. There she is. Hello. Hello. There we go. I'm looking a little rough. I was work. I wasn't expecting to be telling a story, but I got caught up in the moment. <laughs> well, my story also is about the North Shore Gaelic singers, about. A grandfather of one of them, he was uh, 
nine years old when he and his sister, their mother, she was put out of the home that she lived in because the, the, the man of the house had died. So uh, there were two, this was in Harris, and there were two big sailing schooners on the uh, on either side of what they call the Livrick. We'd call it a wharf today. And this man, Kenneth Morrison, and his sister Christy, she was 12, they were, the wharf was down sort of at the bottom of a hill. And they were walking down hand in hand and the wharf was covered with people, everyone trying to get on these two schooners. And their mother was a little piece behind them. So she lost sight of them. And the two kids went ahead and they got onto one schooner. And it wasn't very long after that when the two schooners took off and left. And it was late that afternoon when the kids started looking for their mother. And they went through this sailing ship asking for their mother and they couldn't find their mother anywhere. And the sailing ship came over and it landed in Fedor. And of course there, there were people that, that most of them were coming to this side down to Reckler. So they took these two kids and they brought them up uh, at least a uh, six months later, I'll finish that part first. Six months later, a letter came and it was from their children, the children's mother, because she knew they were coming to Recco. One ship was coming over to Cape Breton. The other one was going to Australia and she landed in Australia and the children landed here. And they were brought up, uh, uh, out rear little river and that was Montana Dan his story about his grandfather I happen to have um, some of the recordings from the from the Smithsonian and a month or so ago I went back and listened to them and this story was on it and I thought my gosh these kids grew up without their mother you know but there were lots of people to take care of them okay lovely yeah, that's a little different from uh, children getting driven to school and picked up for lunch, isn't it? Yes, it certainly yeah. is. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Nona. Lovely. Yeah. Hmm. I have another one from uh, Alan McGinnis. Maybe you've heard this one, Meryl, and you can you can straighten me out if I get it sideways a little bit. Uh, it's about the the dinosaur, the Dominion dinosaur. Do you know that story? The dinosaur? Uh, dinosaur, yeah. Well, um, uh, um, okay, well, Alistair McGinnis fished out of Little River where you fished out of for, for many years. And this one year he had a fella working with him from Ontario and the guy was homesick. He wanted to go home before the season was over. This was into, well into June. So Alistair said, well, all right, the, the boys are almost done school. They can finish the season with me. So off the fellow went and um, David and Alan finished the season with their dad. They were, I think, 15 and 13 at the time or, or thereabouts. And when they went fishing, uh, the first thing they do in the morning is go out and check the net. They set a net to catch, you know, herring and mackerel and other bait fish to put in the lobster traps. And they were out this morning, this one morning, no float, no net, nowhere well, what's going on here? They drove around a bit trying to find it and couldn't, so they went and hauled their traps. And They came back the next morning and the float was there and they started to pull the net up and this great huge tail came up out of the water. And uh, young Alan, who was 13 at the time, he said, he, I was there with one hand on a float pin in the gunnel and the other one on this great big tail and he said, now the boat we were in was 34 feet and this was bigger and it was a shark. It was a basking shark that got caught in the net. And Alistair was, was, was kind of scratching his head wondering, what am I going to do with a 40 foot fish in a 34 foot boat? And all of a sudden the tail started going like this, back and forth. It was still alive. 
let go of it. He said, for God. Oops. Oh, we lost. Oops, whoops. Yeah, yeah, sorry, we did. Yeah. We left off and the tail was going like this. <laughs> Drop it for God's sake. He said, don't smash us to bits. So he let it go and, and it sank out of sight. And they went off and hauled the traps. And they came back the next morning and the float was there and they, they started pulling it in the net was empty. And they figured the, the shark had died during the night and rolled out of the net. So they took the net, uh, had big holes in it, took it to a fellow named McDonald that had hatched. And when it came back, he said there was one spot where there was a hole, 126 meshes at two, three quarter inches a piece in the net. He said that's a 24 foot hole where the, where the shark had been. And that was the end of the story until the next week. And in the evening, they're at home and Alistair sitting in his chair reading the paper and he starts to laugh. What is it, Dad? Come here, he says, and he points to the article. Something got washed up on the beach at Dominion. And someone figured, it's a dinosaur. And Alistair said, it could only be the shark that was in their net the week before. There you are. <laughs> I'm waiting for someone to pick up the ball. Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I've only got one story, she said, when we started. <laughs> well, really. Uh, this is a fish story also. Uh, Meryl is so much better at telling stories than me, but I'll, and anyway, back in the day when, before Little River, when there were all ports at uh, Rack Cove and Britain Cove and and there was the boats came up every day that, on the slip. Anyway, uh, the smack came around. It was a boat. The buyers came around and bought the lobsters. So the smack came to Rat Cove, and there's this particular guy who liked the, a little bit of a drink. And um, he pulled up, tied his boat up on the side of the, the smack boat. And he went in the cabin and to do his the paperwork and a little treat. So when he came out of the cabin, he looked on shore and there was the wife and the kids. So he thought, oh boy, I better pull myself together. So he straightened right up, put his both hands on the gunnel and jumped over to jump into his <laughs> boat. Only thing is, it was on the wrong side of the boat. <laughs> <laughs> the wrong side the boat was on the other side. <laughs> so they had to fish him out. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> you know, that triggers so there was one of them. Well, they were they were pretty pretty highly regarded characters, them smackers. That's yeah. what we call them, the smackers. Yeah. yeah. And one of them, one of the most <laughs> renowned one of the crew, his name was Snowball. That was his christened name, yeah. Snowball Allen. And he came from Cape Tormentine. And here, not, not 10 years ago, I happened to be at a friend's, Jim, Jim Murray's house in, near Cape Tormentine. And somehow the discussion came up about Snowball Allen. And we're sitting at his kitchen table and he said, well, which Snowball? I said, well, Snowball Allen, there couldn't be any more than one of them. Yes, he said there was, there was two. Chris and names at Snowball Allen in, in Cape Tarmatai. Wow. <laughs> that was a pretty unusual name. That was that was the names, and they used to come from. They they were uh, they were like cruise ships in comparison to the boats that were used yeah. by fishermen back. They had forty footers and 40, 40, 42 footers back when a lot of the boats here. Some of them were still rowing using yeah. using rowboats, and they all came mm. from around the Shediac area. Most of them. <laughs> There was a bunch of them. Yeah. I will mention that our next session of, of New Moon Story, number three, is going to be at the at the New Moon in November, which is the, well, he loses the note, um, November the 15th. And one of our guests will be John Hamilton. He's a, he's a, 
a little Scottish fella. Um, he's an ophthalmologist who works in Bedeck and in, uh, and in uh, Antigonish. And quite a sense of humor. And when he gets going, Nancy, he'd never run out of stories that I've ever heard. <laughs> of course, I, I don't concentrate that well because whenever I see him, he's pointing a needle right at my eye and I don't like that too much. So he'll be one guest and we have a couple of others on the hook, but I don't know who it's going to be for sure. For sure, style right, that's going to be on the Sabbath. It, oh, well, it? yes. <laughs> we, we might have to record it on the Saturday, Marilyn. <laughs> <laughs> might have to, yeah. What time? What? What, what time? time? 7 p.m. Oh, same time, 7 p.m. Atlantic time. Yeah. Um, it's, I've heard a couple of times that people think I'm getting cranky in my old age and I say baloney <laughs> cranky me um, I think that as I get older I have, I have more inclined to say what's on my mind um, and I like that amongst my friends too we, we say what it is and uh, there are things that have always bothered me I'm just about to launch into a long story here. And one of the things that bothers me is volunteer fire departments. I wonder if your head might jerk up at that. These are our, our neighbors and friends and family and they're, they're people who do what they do for free. They get what, a very small tax deduction, I think, tax credit. Tax credit, yeah. Um, yeah. But they, they spend their time and energy to learn how to come out to, to deal with uh, emergencies in the first place. Um, so when the bell rings, they drop whatever they're doing and come out. And it bothers me that they spend probably 70 or 80 percent of their time as firefighters trying to raise money so that they will have the equipment they need when they come out to help us for free. And with that uh, stewing around in my mind, I, a couple of years ago, several years ago, I wrote a poem called The Fireman's Book. Do you remember that, Meryl? Yeah, I do. We printed, uh, printed yeah. a couple of hundred copies of that and sold yeah. it and raised some funds for the department. So. Yeah. Um, I can do that. Tara, are you being attacked? No, so we have to go. <laughs> no, no, it, it, <laughs> no, you don't. It's just I am in the building, so there's other staff around. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Ah. Yeah, that'd be a good idea, Bill. Here it is. Well, I don't know if you can see it. Probably not, but no. I can see it anyway. <laughs> but uh, I will do that. It's it's about seven or eight minutes, and it's it could be a true story. I'll bet you. So this is the fireman's book. When Wilfred sold up and moved to North Shore, he said, I'm retired. I won't work no more. I'll sit in the ice and go fishing for smelt until the spring comes and the ice starts to melt. I'll cut my own firewood, stack it up back, or I'll go to the ferry and catch a few mackerel. Play cribbage on Sunday, throw darts at the hall, and in between times, I'll do nothing at all. Sit and watch hockey with a cold beer in hand. I think this retirement life will be grand. But Wilfred soon found the retirement caper, like so many other things, look good on paper. The joy of the ice fishing started to pale in a box from Bedeck Bay, freezing his tail. The wife getting cranky, her sharp tonguey felt as the freezer filled up with near 3,000 smelt. His plan to watch hockey games soon came to grief when all he could get on TV was the Leafs. Morning and evening, his chainsaw it roared until he cut nearly 56 cord. The problem, said Wilf, is I've never been lazy and with nothing to do, I just make myself crazy. I cut too much wood, caught too many fishes. I, I'm so bloody bored, I've even washed dishes. Then said his wife, may I ask a question? If you've no ideas, let me make a suggestion. Instead of just sitting here cursing the leaves, go down to the hall, have a chat with the chief. You may decide not, but give her a hook. You could be a fireman at Indian Brook. A fireman, said Wilf. Now, how about that? Big yellow boots and a fireman's hat, a uniform shirt and a free license plate and fire insurance at discounted rates. Something to do to keep myself active? I'd say overall that sounds very attractive. I'll go to the chief and offer my service, though I have to confess I'm a tiny bit nervous. I'm sure it takes more than just burning desire. There'd be lots to learn if I wanted to fight fires. So, Wilf and the chief, they had a good natter for nearly two hours discussing the matter. 
clouds had closed in, and it just started raining. And Wilfred said, Chief, now what about training? Wilfred, you're right. When the siren goes, before you go out, there's some things you should know. We've tried different methods, and what works the best is to study the manual, then take the test. He gave him a wink and got up from his chair. I'll be back in a minute. Now you wait right there. After a time, Wilf stretched and he yawned. He went to the window, looked out at the pond, wandered around, rubbed his sore knee, sat down again, had a sip of cold tea, wondering what had become of the chief. Was thinking of leaving when, to his relief, he heard a loud rumble and said to himself as he watched all the bric-a-brac dance on the shelf, If I didn't know better, I'd suppose that's the sound of a coal cart, but the mines are all closed. The kitchen door opened. The loud noise got louder with a screeching of wheels that would curdle fresh chowder. In came the chief, pushing a trolley with a look on his face like an evil friend, golly. Here we are, Wilfred. Come have a look. What we have here is the fireman's book. The wisdom of firemen down through the ages, 3,961 pages. Study it up, and when you're all through, come back and see me and get volume two. They loaded the book in the back of Will's truck, and all the way home he kept saying, oh, shucks. I knew from the start there would be some learning before I rush into a building that's burning. If I were to study 10 pages a day, it would take me a year plus the whole month of May, and that includes weekends and holidays, too. Well, that solves the problem of nothing to do. I'll need reading glasses by the time I'm all done, and keep it in mind. This is just volume one. So, Will started learning, and once he got going, he went at it hard with no signs of slowing. By cutting back sleep and no time out to play, he worked up to 22 pages a day. Chapters and verses of facts and statistics, all kinds of smoke and their characteristics, raising infernos in wrong verse. I got the wrong verse. I lost the verse, and I wrote the thing, and I should know better than that. There we are. Chapters and verses of facts and statistics, all kinds of smoke and their characteristics. Wood stoves and chimneys and dangerous dampers and brush fires started by careless campers. Cases of arson from dishonest crooks. All of it there in the fireman's book. Day after day, through snow, sleet, and rain, Wilf turned the pages and filled up his brain. Couplings and hoses and pressures and valves and when to use ointments and when to use salves. Raging infernos and flying pan fires. Blazing old barns and smoldering tires. All of it pertinent, nothing extraneous. Electrical spark and combustion spontaneous. Pump trucks, hose trucks, ladder and hook, and stunning detail in the fireman's book. He worked through Thanksgiving and into November, as the daylight grew short and the chill of December, while children were nestled all snug in their beds, he turned the last page at the end of his eds. He closed the back cover, got up from his chair, rubbed his sore neck, and said a small prayer. That's volume one, and I'm now halfway through. In came a woman. Was it someone he knew? He heard her say, there you are. Welcome back, dear. I'm Mildred, your wife. Would you like a cold beer? As Wilfred recovered from months of hard study, his brow grew less wrinkled, his features more ruddy. After a time, he dreamt less, less of fires and turned his attention to other desires. Finally, Mildred, that timid weed mouse, said, Wilfred, enough now. Get out of the house. I know that you're bored and need something to do. Go see the chief and get volume two. And though he... Oh... See, I don't forget this, um, except when I do. Huh. Go see the chief and get volume two. Now, don't look like that, dear. Don't worry or fret. We'll make a fireman out of you yet. And though it was something he knew he must do, Wilf was reluctant to start volume two. With shoulders that sagged and a heart that was heavy, he loaded book one in the back of the Chevy. And though he was tempted to quit or to stall, just a few minutes, he was back at the hall. The kitchen door opened, and out came the chief. The look on his face was a stunned disbelief. Wilfred, my boy, what are you doing here? I didn't expect you to springtime next year. When Wilfred explained that he'd done the first half, the chief looked right at him and started to laugh. Wilfred, to say the least, found that distressing. After all that hard work, he said, what's so amusing? I studied for months with nearly no rest so I could do well on the fireman's test. And to tell you the truth, it seems a disgrace. I get halfway done and he'd laugh in my face. Wilford, I'm sorry. 
But I swear this is true. You've just passed the test. There is no volume two. Should he be happy or should he be vexed? Wilford was, was unsure of what to do next. He wandered around, scuffed his boot in the dirt, looked at the chief in his uniform shirt and yellow tie splattered with blackberry jelly tied eight inches short to show off his belly. He said, chief, you tricked me and that isn't nice. Wilfred, I'm sorry, but here's some advice. You're not done with learning and this part's not funny. What you must do now is learn to raise money. The county will now and then send a few bucks, but it's barely enough to put fuel in the trucks. If we want new hoses or helmets or boots or fireproofs, glove or waterproof suits or anything else that we need for ourselves, we must be as busy as sat as we yells with yard sales and bake sales and even split winners, but most of our revenue comes from our dinners. You must learn to cook and to peel a potato. To be a good fireman is to be a good waiter. Wilfred said, Chief, I'm, I'm somewhat dejected. That's all right, son. It's to be expected. You likely dreams of heroics and glory. Reality, though, is a whole different story. But you meet lots of people and make some new friends, have fun at the meetings and training weekends. You get to swap tales with some really good liars, and once in a while, we go put out fires. You'll want to get started. I can see you're just itching. Come with me, fireman. Let me show you the kitchen. Nice. Huh. I'm imagining a wild applause. That's what <laughs> I do to keep myself sane anyway. <laughs> hey. We we had arranged or we're starting to arrange uh, some live presentations with fire departments up and down Cape Breton where I would come and do some storytelling and tell that and offer copies of, of this book for sale to raise funds for the departments. But then we got the virus, and uh, so that's that's kind of on hold for the moment. The story I shared uh, the other night with you, can I share it with the rest? About uh, a call I was on, talking about fire departments? Yes. Okay. This was a few <laughs> years ago. No names mentioned. It was, a, it was a, a, sort of late in the evening, and it was in the fall, so there was snow on the ground. And um, it was before the road was reconstructed, so there was still a very sharp turn down at Red Cove. And this fellow who had far, far too many drinks was driving. He left, he didn't make the turn, clipped off a tree and rolled down an embankment. If he hadn't been in the state he was with the amount of alcohol in him, he probably would have been either dead or uh, seriously injured, but he, all he had was a little bit of cuts and bruises on him. So anyway, arrived, the police arrived and we were waiting for the ambulance. He wasn't, he wasn't really hurt, but he, the, the police made him very agitated. So they had the common sense to stay away from him. So I had to deal with him. So to keep him uh, sort of calm, I just talked to him and I decided I'd start filling out the form. So one of the questions on the form was, are you taking any medication? Sort of looked at me and I said, uh, drugs, are you taking any drugs? Oh, he says, and he starts naming off this list of drugs until a clue in my head, these aren't prescription drugs, these are all illegal. I said, no, 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 do you take any prescription drugs? Oh no, I don't take any of that. So, <laughs> so when the paramedics came, I handed them over. That was enough of that. <laughs> That's the end of my story. Triggers, triggers. Got any fire call uh, stories, Meryl? Or fire department well, stories? What it brought back a memory of of when we put the extension, the first original fire hall was, was the old school. And, and the, we, we put a building, the, the main part of the social end of the, the dining room and area now. We built that on and we were thinking, how are we going to pay for it? And at the same time, it was around the time that Red Cove Hydro started. And there was like hundreds and hundreds of people moving in and they, we knew that they'd be looking for entertainment. So myself and Barry McDonald and, and Jackie Buchanan 
we're kind of <laughs> commissioned to to try and get things rolling to make money for the fire hall. Well, we figured uh, in our minds that the best way to do it would be to attract people, but to have a, have a licensed barrel, which was none whatsoever on the North Shore at that time. So we met with the executive and they said, well, the best way to do this before you proceed any further, you go to both, both sessions of the United and Presbyterian churches, gather them together and get their opinion. So the night came and in them days, the sessions of each congregation had about 12 people on them. So myself, myself and Barry and Jack and the chief were there to try and sell the deal. So, well, they, they, they asked a lot of questions and how are we gonna control it? And we had all that figured out. And finally there was this one, probably the oldest, oldest gentleman that was the oldest elder that was there in attendance uh his name is red dan smith from jersey cove not said a word not a boo came out of him all night so at the end of the <laughs> at the end of the meeting we were supposed to the sessions were going to go both to their respective corners and in fact it was within a week of what their decision was so the chief said to this, Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, what do you think of the whole situation? And he stopped and he licked these chops for a minute and he looked up at the ceiling. Well, it'll lead to hell and damnation in the end. And that was the way the meeting ended. <laughs> we figured the ceiling was gonna fall down on top of us that night. We figured she was game over. But after about 10 days or two weeks, they came back and uh, allowed us to, uh, Partake in the license bar, and it's been going ever since. That was the first one in the community. And it took a lot of negotiating, I'll tell you. <laughs> it was pretty tense. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Both of these guys arrived here about the same time as the as the uh, as the Cape Breton Mountains. I think I'm a come from away. I, I've been here 13 years now, and. Uh, Merrill and um, An Angelo started a, a couple of years ago. They started a, what was that called for the new new people? Newcomers. Coming? Newcomers, yeah. So the local people and the people who had come to move to Cape Breton got together for a potluck supper in the, in the fire hall. And uh, it was really lovely. And, and everyone would tell where they came from and why they came and what it was like. So... I have I have two um, short pieces about what it's like to be a, a, a come from away Cape Breton. We arrived here on a very rainy uh, April 30th, and on the just took the mattress out of the truck and fell asleep. And in the morning, Rosemary went off to to see if she could find Sydney and find a, a refrigerator. So I'm standing there looking at the mud at the back of a five-ton truck full to the roof of stuff. And I thought, I'm going to be here for days because we knew nobody. I no sooner had that thought and I hear a motor coming up the driveway. And it's Meryl McGinnis and his daughter Amy and Don Duffy. Would you like a hand? Yes. <laughs> and in two hours, the, the four of us had that truck empty and everything in the house or in the leaky storage shed. And Boy, welcome to Cape Breton, right? Even a parrot, I remember. Was there not? Was there a parrot there? Uh, cockatiel. Or a rabbit. We had a cockatiel, or some... yep. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> that was a wet day. It was poor, it was spilling rain. It was, yeah. it was a wet day, yep. And we had seen oh, the storage awesome. shed out, out the back there, but never been in it. So I opened the door and it was raining just as hard inside as out. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> had to put a bunch of stuff there anyway. Yeah. Still there. Oh, good. I think we might be getting near the end. Is there anyone else on the sidelines that would like to join in with a, a little story before we go? All right. Dum, 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 dum. Give me a second. There's nothing good. I um, Okay. I will say thank you very much to, to Chief Merrill McGinnis and to Chief Nancy 
Smith for their their uh, cooperation and participation and for showing up with no stories and keeping us going this long. Oh. <laughs> and my goal when we started doing these things online was to get as close as we could to sitting around the kitchen table and just passing the buck. And I think we accomplished that. So thank you very much for that. Yes. And for all the people who joined in. Yes. Can I also th say thank you to all the storytellers? So Nona too, and Bill. So Bill, our storyteller in residence. I um, thank you uh, for all of this, and also for uh, connecting us, even at this time when we can't be face to face, or it's hard to be two meters apart and twenty people in a room. <laughs> Um, so I, I just I do appreciate all the efforts that he makes to keep stories happening and keep programs happening. But uh, it was an entertaining night, and um, you paint a beautiful picture of the North Shore. Very humorous folks and neighborly people, and uh, really a lovely place to live. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, have a great night, and I hope we see you again. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it. I'll have to start trying to recount some more stories. And we'll do it again. That's right. <laughs> we, may, yeah. we, can, we can lie pretty good down here, too, if we want to walk to Nancy, right? Oh, we, <laughs> do, yeah, yeah, yeah. we can make we them so good. That sounds perfect. <laughs> sounds great. People are saying thank you on the sidelines, too. So um, the, the participants in the audience, I, I thank you for joining us, too, everybody. It's it's a little awkward, I know, to probably be an audience on a list somewhere, but I uh, appreciate you um, and listening with us. So thank you, everyone. So yeah, I can take your mask off now. Fata Buam, Kimi Buam, Rimmer